my name is Megan Redshaw and you're watching another episode of Legal Watch. I have a special guest with us today. His name is Patrick, Patrick Girondi. He is Italian. He has long been involved in activities related to rare diseases. In 1983, he was instrumental in the startup of the Robin Hood Association, a nonprofit organization providing financial aid for medical services to patients with rare diseases. In 1992, he later focused his efforts on a life-threatening blood disorder, thalassemia. A partnership was later formed with emerging pharmaceutical technology to advance the development of treatments for thalassemia. He, since then, has been involved in numerous organizations and initiatives for that disease. He has received honors and awards, including award from India Thalassemia Foundation, the Thalassemia International Federation, Cooley's Anemia International and Cooley's Anemia Foundation. He is the current founder of Sunroco Therapeutics, focusing on gene therapy for thalassemia. Thank you so much, Patrick, for joining us today. Thank you. So you kind of have a very interesting story to share with us as the founder of Sunroco Therapeutics. You're having some difficulties getting access to something that you need for the treatment of this disease. I kind of just like to fill in some of the gaps for our readers before we begin on how you got started with thalassemia and involved in this basically medical research treatment genre. Sure, my son, uh, my oldest son was diagnosed with thalassemia in 1992. In 1993, I, I started a company around a um, hemoglobin enhancer because thalassemia is a defect on the beta globin gene, just like sickle cell disease is a defect on the beta globin gene. The beta globin gene is the adult hemoglobin gene. So when we're about a year and a half old, our uh, hemoglobin goes from being a fetal hemoglobin or gamma globin gene, and it, that turns off and the beta globin gene turns on. The problem for sickle cell disease patients and my thalassemic patients like my son is that they have a defective beta globin gene. So um, they need to do transfusions um, and iron chelation uh, and without them, they basically will die. So in 1993, I founded a company around a research that stimulated fetal hemoglobin or the gamma globin gene so that these patients could continue to have a higher hemoglobin. I was very happy to do that because in the early 90s, there still had not been antibodies discovered for AIDS and hepatitis C. So every time you transfuse back then, it was like uh, Russian roulette. Um, and uh, in 1995, uh, I became partners with John Walton of Walmart. Uh, we were partners until 2004. The Walmart family put in about $20 million into the company, um, and we pushed research ahead. In 2000, I met Michelle Settlin, a gene therapy expert from Memorial Sloan Kettering. He's a Frenchman, but he's been working at Memorial Sloan Kettering for 25 years or better. I met him, and he had just publicized in Nature magazine that he had cured six generations of thalassemic mice. I met with him and I realized that that would, that gene therapy would be able to cure my son. Um, in 2005, uh, we signed a worldwide license, um, exclusive license and took over that gene therapy. Uh, basically in 2010, the therapy was sabotaged by Third Rock Ventures and uh, Blue Bird Bio. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't realize any of this until 2018. Um, the court ended, the, the uh, trial ended, or the uh, process ended because we went to court trying to uh, have our product returned to us. And today we do now own um, an exclusive license with Memorial Sloan Kettering for TNS9 vector. Recently, Michelle said, meaning in February or March, Michelle Settlin, the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, genetist, who is worldwide famous, he's been on the front page of the New York Business 
section probably 10 times in the last 20 years, he published an article stating that lentiviral vectors, which ours is a lentiviral vector, lentiviral vectors are made by the disabled AIDS virus, which we then put the gene into, in our case, the beta globin gene, make billions of copies and then return it to the patient so that they express their own beta globin gene and their hemoglobin is now normal. This will cure both sickle cell disease patients and thalassemic patients. Um, but uh, Bluebird Bio, our main competitor, has had, their head, they have had patients with issues with sickle cell disease, myelodysplastic syndrome, and clonal dominance. Um, we're not sure, nobody's probably really sure why these situations happened with patients that they treated. However, Memorial Sloan Kettering published in February or March in Nature Magazine that putting an insulator on these lentiviral vectors of which ours is one and, beta, and Bluebird Bios is one makes them safer because when they fall on the chromosomes, it insulates them from the genes that they fall next to. So if you were to fall next to an oncogene with an insulator, you would be less likely to trigger that oncogene, for example. So it's like an so, insulator, like a molecule or a particle then? Yeah, I mean, exactly. yeah, I'm trying to understand what exactly an insulator, you said, explain what it does, but I'm- yeah, so in, yeah, sure. So in our homes, we have insulation between, in the walls. So the insulation protects, we don't hear the sound from the other side of the wall or it holds heat in or it holds heat out. It's the same kind of uh, idea. So an insulator basically protects the, the, the um, vector so that it doesn't interfere with the other genes around it. So it's pretty crucial to have this then is what you're saying. Like without having it, you could potentially subject the person that you're treating to certain adverse events or you know, the treatment could be ineffective. Yes, this is, this is what has been published um, by Memorial Sloan Kettering um, themselves. And um, we have the worldwide license to commercialize a product that they have with the insulator on it. The product, it, there's enough for four patients and it's sitting in the freezers of Sloan Kettering. And they, re, they refuse to give it to us, to return it to us. And worse than that, I mean, I could understand if this was about greed, you know, where you would say, well, they're not going to give it back to you because they want to use it. But they received $15.7 million grant from the New York Stem Cell Organization in 2014 to improve this factor. And between 2014 and 2017, 18, they put an insulator on, they made it better. Now we own that product. So if they weren't willing to give it to us because they thought that they were going to sell it for more money or they thought that they would go and do their own clinical trials, that, I, that would at least be understandable. They're not doing anything with it. It's abandoned. They are not funding the trial, according to their researcher. So why would they do this, though? Like, if you have, like, what's the reason then that they would just keep this in a freezer and not give it back to you, not do anything with it? Well... I mean, I, um, so the CEO of Memorial Sloan Kettering up until two weeks ago, he's been there for about 12 and a half years. Um, he received about $110 million worth of funding from a group called Third Rock Ventures. They're a big biotech firm in Massachusetts, Boston or Cambridge. Um, he, Craig B. Thompson, who is the uh, chief uh, was the CEO for 12 years. He just stepped down. His company, Ajos Pharma, received, like I said, over $100 million in funding. And, and this Rock. is the company that you mentioned earlier, along with Bloomberg Biotech, that kind of sabotaged in the yes. beginning, right? Okay. Uh, yes. I mean, we have, we have court records and they're all publicly filed and anybody could get them. It's the New York uh, Supreme Court uh, 150856 slash 2017. It's all on the docket, but we have proof that they knew that we had a better product and they basically sabotaged it. Now, 
I can't say for sh sure what Craig B. Thompson did or didn't do, but his he founded a company in 2007, uh, between 2007 and 2012, that company received over hundred million in funding money raised by Third Rock Ventures. In 2012, Craig Thompson was a uh, front page uh, news of the New York Times was sued for intellectual property theft um, by where he worked for 11 years prior, um, Abramson Cancer Center and the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, in the newspaper article, they said that he never uh, basically told anyone that he started this company, his own company, and that it was in reality their intellectual property that he started this company with. Eventually, that was settled out of court. However, there is this very close relationship between Adjo's Pharma, Craig B. Thompson, and uh, Bluebird Bio, because then uh, Third Rock Ventures purchased Bluebird Bio in 2010. So they bought it outright in 2010. So, I mean, I can't really say, I mean, I'm, Craig B. Thompson could be a, a wonderful guy, et cetera, but when you ask, why is it that they're not pushing it forward? And why are they not returning? Why are they not giving out a sour property? Um, I mean, I guess the first question is why are that, aren't they return, giving us our property? And the answer would be, I'm not sure. Maybe they, they're trying to exploit it themselves. But the fact of the matter is that they are not trying to exploit it. Bluebird Bio is ready to get their product approved. It'll likely be approved in August. Their product does not have an insulator on it. And therefore, we believe is likely less safe than our product, not to mention that we have always used the price of the product to be 700,000 per patient. Instead, Bluebird Bio will charge 2.1 million per patient. Now these vectors, these therapies are very expensive to produce. I mean, it could cost up to 300,000 per patient to produce. And then of course you had, have to add other expenses. So 700,000 is ridiculously high. We'd like to get it down further, but it's a third of what Bluebird Bio will ask for their products. So, I mean, is there a scheme to make sure that the cheaper, more superior, safer product doesn't get to the patients? Yeah, that's what it seems like it is. Why they're doing this, why Sloan Kettering is acting this way, you, you'd have to ask them. So if I'm understanding this, you have Third Rock and you have Bloomberg Bio. Those are your two kind of companies that, and you said Third Rock, or, or you said, was it um, Third Rock purchased or merged with Bloomberg? Third, Third Rock, yes, Third, Third Rock Ventures in 2010 purchased Bluebird Bio. Okay, and own. obviously they, that entity has given millions of dollars to um, Sloan Kettering. Well, no, not to Sloan Kettering, to Ajo's Pharma. Okay. And Ajo's, it would be great if it was Sloan Kettering. It's even worse than that. So Ajo's Pharma is the company that the CEO of Sloan Kettering founded. So okay, that actually, makes sense because I'm like, where's the, it, there has to be, in my mind, some money factoring in here because either for MSK or for the CEO that was there for 12, 12 and a half years and owns this other company, because that would make sense. You favor the other product that you have a vested interest in over another product that there's been controversy with your hospital or agency or company over, and you favor the approval of this one product because it's gonna make you more money, even though they're cutting corners by not using an insulator. And the alternative is your product, which is still expensive, but much cheaper, and also has an insulator on it, which makes it much safer. So it's almost like they're withholding for whatever reason, the safer, better, potentially more effective alternative to a product that makes them a lot more money. Yeah, I mean, and the problem is that it would be great if it was making Memorial Sloan Kettering a lot more money because in the end, you know, I mean, Sloan Kettering is a great research institute. I have no problem with them. But the real issue is, unfortunately, is there's a huge, there's always been, I mean, I wrote letters to the board of Sloan Kettering in 2012. And again, I believe in 15, there's a huge, there was always a huge conflict of interest. So a, you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering is a not-for-profit. Well, the problem is, is that when the CEO of your not-for-profit actually has his own company and has received 
over $100 million funding for his own company from a company that you have a product that is a direct competitor with. And so this is the real issue to me. It seems that um, it's not necessarily Memorial Sloan Kettering, but it is executive probably, in my opinion, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, who is economically hooked at the hip with Third Rock Ventures, who he received over $100 million for his own private company for, and who Third Rock Ventures purchased my competitor, Bluebird Bio. So they're still out there and want to make sure that Bluebird Bio gets out there with their product that costs three times more, $1.4 million per patient more, which, and it doesn't have an insulator, so is very likely less safe. And I'm not saying it's less safe. Memorial Sloan Kettering saying it's less safe. So they're not only giving me my property, which I own, which is sitting in their freezers, which is better for patients. They're also not doing anything with it. And it's sitting in their freezers. And um, their own researcher is desperate because he is the inventor. He did this to secure patients. He's been working on this project for over 30 years. And he's scared to death that, unfortunately, Bluebird, Bluebird Bio's product, which does not have an insulator, which has had leukemia problems, which has had myelodysplasive uh, syndrome problems, which has had clonal dominance problems, issues, created a halt to all gene therapy in 2009. He's scared to death that that product is going to hurt patients going into the future, especially when he has a product sitting in the freezer with an insulator ready to go into patients tomorrow in a clinical trial that's still open. Yet he has his hands tied because executives at Memorial Sloan Kettering will not allow him to do what's in the best interests of patients. Now, I'm not saying Memorial Sloan Kettering is doing this. The Thompson, the CEO, is no longer the CEO at Memorial Sloan Kettering. He has been replaced by Selwyn Vickers about three weeks ago. So I'm not disparaging Memorial Sloan Kettering. I'm speaking about their former CEO who has this huge hundred million financial relationship for his company, Ajos Pharma, which is a publicly traded company with a market cap of about $3 billion. And it basically seems that that's what's preventing our patients from getting a safer product. Is there a way like, you know, because there was, you had a previous lawsuit settlement that they were supposed to turn over this product. Is there a way like you can have a court order or a judge can intervene or somebody can order them to turn over the product to you or do something with it? Yes, we've just amended our complaint. So um, we were suing Stone Kettering because we realized that when they put an insulator on our product, they filed a patent claiming that it was a new product, which is kind of crazy in itself because it's our vector. They just put an insulator on it. You know, if you put Michelin tires on a car instead of Firestone, it doesn't make it a new car. Um, and we thought that was kind of crazy. And initially we thought, well, they must be trying to go ahead with that product to save patients and they want the economic interest in it, which you could almost understand, but it's sitting in the freezer doing nothing. And so we have recently filed an amendment, amended complaint um, in New York, which you can see because it's part of the public docket in which we're saying that you're basically fraudulent, dealing with us fraudulently. So we are, in fact, um, trying to do whatever we can to protect the patients. Is there some sort of timeline? Like, could what's in the freezer now expire before you're able to use it in the clinical trial or get a pro product to market? Yeah, there's that's no I'm asking is time of the essence as far as like the well, expiration of that goes. Yes, I mean, all medicines have some sort of an expiration, but the biggest expiration that we have is Bluebird Bio looks like they're going to get approved in August of 2022. So in just a few months, they may get the orphan drug exclusivity. If they get the orphan drug exclusivity, then it creates a very slippery slope for anyone who wants to compete against them because 
basically no one will be able to compete against them in the United States for seven years and in Europe for 10 years. Now, what does that mean? I mean, how can you compete with them if your product is a little bit different, if it's a little bit better? I mean, it's, it's uh, really, really dangerous because uh, funding basically dries up once someone gets orphan drug exclusivity. And, and it looks like, you know, Bluebird Bio will have the approval in August of 2022. And if they, in fact, get out orphan drug exclusivity, then it may be game over. So that seems like there's an added dimension there. It's like another, I, I don't know if you would call it conflict of interest, but there's definitely an incentive to suppress the competitor until this drug gets approved in August, because then it can get that, um, what did you call it, orphan? Orphan drug, exclusivity. orphan drug exclusivity. Yes. It's part of the Orphan Drug Act of 1983 when a lot of wonderful people, including Marlene Hafner, um, they tried to make sure that some of these products, uh, some of these diseases like thalassemia, which only have 2,500 patients in all of North America, or sickle cell disease, which only has 100,000 patients in all of North America, um, that they would get some money um, funding towards them. So they made this the Orphan Drug Act. And one of the benefits to the, pay, to the uh, company that is first to get the orphan drug exclusivity is they have uh, no com competition for seven years in the United States. In Europe, it's 10 years. This really doesn't seem like it benefits the patient at all. It seems like it benefits the, benefits the pharmaceutical company. Yes. I mean, I, I think it was a great idea in 1983, but it's been 40 years. It needs to be revisited. Um, because the other thing that the orphan drug exclusivity basically did was said that, that you could charge any price that you basically wanted to for this product. And that really hurts the patients as well, because whether we would want to think about it or not, the more a product costs, the less advantageous it is to anyone, whether it's the insurance companies, whether it's the hospitals, whether it's to the patients, it's just less access, um, uh, accessible to everyone. So um, yeah, it's uh, exactly like you stated. And it's, it's the FDA that has to actually approve this drug in August, right? Yes. And I mean, uh, it's not the FDA's fault by that there's misbehavior. I mean, the FDA is looking at science. They're, they're not looking at lawsuits. Now, we wrote a citizen's petition in which we said, dear FDA, please don't approve this drug because one, they're infringing on our product. Two, it's less safe. They don't have an ins insulator. Uh, three, they've acted with treachery, and we have all of the documents to prove that they did. And four, it costs three times more than our product. But again, you know, the FDA is, you know, they, they, they're supposed to have blinders on, you know, they're only supposed to look at scientific data. And I certainly don't blame them if they approve the uh, uh, Bluebird uh, product. I mean, um, you know, they're far more intelligent than I have and far more qualified than I am to do their jobs. Um, but it's a real shame, and I'm sure they don't even realize what's going on, that we have a product that's in an ongoing clinical trial that has an insulator on it that is a superior product, by the way, admitted by Bluebird Bio themselves in many court documents that came out in our court case that ended in the end of 2020. Um, and it's all being uh, suppressed and uh, put under the bushel so that, uh, you know, the uh, pharmaceutical interest companies funds uh, can make their billions of dollars. Wow. And this, you're saying this could potentially be the cure for something like sickle cell anemia or thalassemia. Definitely. It I definitely mean, it's is. obviously an alternative to blood transfusions, which somebody with these right. conditions needs to have on a very, very regular basis. Yes. My son transfuses every 20 days. And so, yes, I mean, that's the hardest part of all of this is that, uh, when you know that there's something out there for your child. And by now, all, all thalassemic patients and sickle cell disease patients have become my relatives. Um, it's very hard for you to sit back and just stomach it all. Um, I'm doing the best I can. We're doing the best that we can. We're joined by many other organizations as the Cooley's Anemia International. Um, we're joined by wonderful doctors, uh, Lucho Luxato and, and others who are in our corner, of course. Um, but right now, unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot we can do other than, you know, filing a lawsuit for fraud 
against Memorial Sloan Kettering, which we just did that about a week and a half ago. Yeah, I mean, obviously you would prefer not to have to do that. It'd be so much easier just to write a letter and to have the CEO say, yes, you can get your product here. It's like the freezer or to say, you know what? We'd be happy to like see this through to the end for you. But basically like you're forced now to have to file a lawsuit, which is obviously something you don't want to have to do in order to get your product. And you're under a very short timeline. Should this other product get a approve and kind of get these exclusive protections in the market that would prevent you guys from putting your product forward that could potentially be more beneficial for people with this condition. Yes. And I mean, you know, um, uh, Craig B. Thompson became the CEO of Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, like I said, in 2012, he was sued from Abramson Cancer Center for a billion dollars in the University of Pennsylvania. You can look into the documents. The New York Times uh, article quoted that he at the uh, Abramson Cancer Center that he was an unscrupulous doctor who stole or uh, the largesse of the cancer center that was settled out of court. But then um, in 2018, they had three huge scandals that were front page news in the New York Times. I mean, in 2018, December 31st, you know, it was Memorial Sloan Kettering, a year of scandal. They had uh, one guy who basically put his hands in the uh, cookie jar, uh, Greg Raskin, a uh, 1.4 million, and he was forced to give the 1.4 million back. They had uh, other guys that include some of the board members, I believe, that they started a company, an artificial intelligence company, and they were going to use all the data from Memorial Sloan Kettering cancer patients without telling them that they were going to use their da data, basically, was another scandal. And then there was uh, um, uh, finally the worst scandal or one of the worst scandals was that they had their chief medical officer. Um, he was taking money from Merck uh, uh, and he was at the same time, he wrote 53 articles about the same product that he was taking money from Merck. Um, of course, this is a, a big no, no, you, you can't do that. You have a to lot put of conflicts article. of interest. Yes. Yes. And so, I mean, they the whole tenure that Craig Thompson has been at Memorial Sloan Kettering has been just scandal after scandal after scandal after scandal. For whatever reason, he ended there uh, being there for 12 years. Now, um, it's kind of an interesting spin on the story. So we have a northern institution, you know, one of the biggest and one of the best and Memorial Sloan Kettering does a, wonder, a lot of wonderful fine things like a lot of our companies and our corporations that are not for profits. Unfortunately, when the wrong executives get a hold of them, uh, they can really twist and turn them. And believe me, uh, I believe that Memorial Sloan Kettering patients are victims. I believe that Memorial Sloan Kettering doctors and nurses are victims of these kind of uh, executives. And I believe that a lot of the executives themselves are victims, the people that want to do the right thing. Um, but in the end, um, when things like this happen, uh, you have these scandals that have been going on for 12 years, more or less. And interestingly enough, the new CEO is a Southern gentleman. I've heard nothing but good things about him. So he's just beginning now. So it's kind of a great story how you have this corrupted um, uh, organization, you know, at least, again, I'm not trying to talk bad about it. all you need to do is go and look up the newspaper articles yourself. So you have this, this, um, this organization who has been, you know, lined with scandals and run by a Northern and it's a Northern organization. And now we get a Southern gentleman that's coming up and let's hope he can kind of rid the uh, this wonderful institute from all of this uh, baggage. I mean, I'd be writing him a letter like, hey, I'm suing you. I don't want to sue you. I just need access to the fridge, the freezer. Yeah, I, yeah, that was my first, my knee jerk reaction. My attorney said, well, we think we'll, you know, you should hold off on that. Let's give him a little time. He, uh, like I said, I think his official, his first day might have been a, a week ago. Well, at least it sounds like there's a little bit of hope there that you might be able to hopefully get access to your product if the barrier that was formerly there has been removed. Yes. Hopefully Is there anything I... else that like you haven't covered that I haven't asked you that you feel like anybody watching this needs to know? No, I mean, I think that, 
Memorial Sloan Kettering is a great place. I have no idea why they're paying their CEO 6.7 million. I think that's kind of sad for any not-for-profit to do that. Actually, I think that's kind of pulling the wool over the American's eyes, especially when you know the American taxpayer through the National Institute of Health and National Cancer Institute basically is paying for at least a third of all the research going on there. So I, I, I don't I don't understand all of those things. Um, and hopefully, you know, there'll be legislation against, you know, the, this kind of behavior. Um, and again, I think Memorial Sloan Kettering is a great institute. Anything that I've said is not a disparagement of them, but is all can be found in court documents. Yeah, so factual information that can be found yes. elsewhere, either in court yes. documents or online, like yes. in New York Times. Yes. And when I say that Bluebird Bio knows that our product is better. We have court documents that say that. Um, and, you know, uh, again, I'm not disparaging uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Bluebird Bio. I don't really, you know, care much about them. I mean, I, I, I could say whatever I like. And uh, again, all of the court documents are out there. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. We want to keep following this story. We want to know what happens with the lawsuit. I'm already hoping that the CEO just calls you and says, hey, whoa, like, don't sue us. Let me just give you your product back because that would be so much easier for everybody, including the patients that need access to this product. So I hope you'll come back on Legal Watch again and give us an update when you have one for us. Thanks so much, Megan. I really appreciate it. Thank you.